coming up. Power ranking the top five D-backs from the 2022 season, all on today's Locked On Diamondbacks podcast. You are Locked On Diamondbacks, your daily Arizona Diamondbacks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into the Locked On Diamondbacks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day listening to who? The always charismatic host of this podcast, Miller Thomas. I'm a multimedia journalist and I'm a graphic designer, so please go check out my website, MillerThomas24.myportfolio.com. On there, you can see all my latest work, from my packages to my articles to my photos and my graphic design. If you want to see more content by me, just follow me on Twitter, at CreatorThomas24 for my personal account. Just look up Locked On Diamondbacks on Twitter, Instagram for the podcast handle. And of course, thank you for making Locked on Diamondbacks your first listen every day. We'd not be able to do this podcast without you, my loyal listeners, sharing, subscribing, reviewing, doing all that so I could do this podcast for you. Thank you. It's free and available on all platforms. So please continue to tell your friends. We are also on YouTube. So go hit subscribe on the Locked on Diamondbacks YouTube channel, please, so we could get our subscriber count up. In today's podcast, we are unveiling the top five D-backs from this past season. It's time. We've ranked 10 through 6 so far. We've done honorable mentions, so we're going to get into the list. But before we talk about the top five D-backs from this season, I first want to talk about what the hell Major League Baseball is doing with this playoff setup right now. Because if you notice, of course, you guys are listening to this podcast. It's Thursday morning. You guys watch the Dodgers and Padres um, games you watch the Braves or Phillies games. I'm right now recording in the middle of both of those games. It looks like the Phillies are on their way to a loss with the Braves up um, three nothing. Oh, it looks like the Braves actually might have just won the game um, against the Phillies. Fifth inning right now for the Padres as I'm recording this. So we'll see what happens there. I will know, you know, at the time of <laughs> by the time you guys are listening to this, you will know what happens. But at the time of me recording, I don't know. But regardless, I want to talk about more about how. The American League is just not playing today. How they are just taking a day off, like the divisional series in the American League is taking a day off after playing game one yesterday, the same time as the National League. I'm just like, why baseball? Why did you have four games, both series going, game one all on Tuesday, and then Wednesday you're like, you know what? We're only going to do the National League series because to me, this makes no sense. Now, I get, I, I know why they're doing it. They're doing it for money reasons so you can spread out the series so you can have baseball on every day, extends the series. One day you have National League games. One day you have American League games. Easier for the networks, easier for the coast. I get it from that standpoint. For the money reasons, I understand it. But from the actual Baseball competitive reasons, I don't get this at all because Shane Bieber's likely to start game two for the Cleveland Guardians, and he might have started game two if he had a pitch today because I believe he pitched game one on Friday, so he probably still would have been scheduled to pitch game two regardless whether it's today or tomorrow, but the fact that he gets now an extra day to rest and scout, I think helps him out tremendously. Being a starter on five days rest for six days rest, I think does matter a lot when you're in the postseason time because these pitchers are not leaving anything to chance. They are unloading the tank, the gas tank, just unload it right now because these pitchers are going to throw as hard as they can. They're going to put everything they can into every pitch because guess what? If you make it all the way to the World Series, you might only need to pitch three to five starts, right? It's not like they're going to be adding another 80 innings of work onto their arms. No, if Everything breaks right for the Cleveland Guardians or whoever it is. They your your main starter might only have to pitch like 30 or less innings pitch. So for Shane Bieber to get that extra day of rest, I think helps him out tremendously in this series against a very vaulted New York Yankees team. And when I look at the Yankees now, their game two starter, it's probably going to be like Nestor Cortez or something like that. But now I have a real question of rest versus rust for Nestor Cortez or whoever starting game two for the Yankees because I just don't – now Now Nestor Cortez has spent even longer since his last start in the regular season. It's another day he has to wait, another day to let his arm get cold. Maybe Nestor Cortez does overthinking, too much scouting. You never know. I think it would have been easier for Nestor Cortez to just go pretty 
quickly after the season ended. Of course, they had the first round bye. But if he was scheduled to go today after his team went in game one, I think that would have just built more positive momentum for Ernesto Cortez. For the whole series, I think it just builds better momentum. And so to see the ALDS to take a break for game two the next day, meanwhile, the National League is still playing, I just don't get it. I feel like just this, I, I feel like this takes the number one seed more out of rhythm in the American League than um I well, let me say this. I feel like this really just does take the number one seed in the American League out of rhythm. Like if you're the New York Yankees, like I waited what a week and a half or however long it was for my first postseason game. And then after that first postseason game, I now have a game of rest before game two. Like they're basically playing one baseball game in like a week and a half stretch. Like that just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I don't think that's fair to the number one seed. And versus like the NL teams, like you see the Dodgers and the and the Braves, like they're going back to back in the games, right? The Astros and Yankees now, they play the game one after a week and a half. Now they got to wait another day for game two. Like that's just weird to treat your number one seeds like that. Like that's just really... That I just feel like that's throwing them out of rhythm and just messing up their schedule and giving a clear advantage to the lower seed. And maybe it's okay to build in a little bit of an advantage for the lower seed because they had to play the wild card round and things like that. But if if I win the number one seed and now I'm at a if I win the number one seed and now I have to play and do this whole little charade with the schedule. Like, I'm not happy if I'm a Yankees fan or Astros fan today. I would rather be the Dodgers or Padres playing today, game two. And I also think it would be easier to do game one, game two. And then maybe if the National League has that day off the next day for game three, then you come back, um, you know, the day after for game three, you have that one day in between for rest. I think that's a lot easier doing two days on, one day off than going one day on after a week and a half off and then taking day off and then going back on once again. Like, that just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I know why baseball is doing it, all for money reasons, but from a competitive standpoint, I don't think this was very smart. I think you're screwing over teams like the Yankees and Astros who had phenomenal regular seasons, were some of the best teams in baseball. It's the reason why they had number one seeds. And now, at the end of the year, their number one seed is not really being rewarded, and they're actually losing an advantage to the lower seed. That's not right, Major League Baseball, and I think they need to look into evaluating this stance next year. Now, Let's get into the top five D-backs from the 2022 season. We'll run through the players in our power ranking already. Honorable mentions was Ketan Marte, Ryan Nelson, and Kevin Ginkle. Number 10 was Corbin Carroll. Nine, Dre Jameson. Eight, Ryan, oh, eight Kyle Nelson. Seven, Josh Rojas. And then six with Joe Mantiply. So checking in at number five on the top 10 D-backs from this past season. Number five, Dalton Varsho, who is a huge fan favorite because this is someone that was a super heralded prospect, that's someone as a catcher that could be a 30-30 kind of a guy. And we saw glimpses and flashes and more than that this past season because he had near 30 home runs, 27 bombs for Dalton Varsho, 15 plus stolen bases. Like it was a great, it was a really good season. Maybe not a great season. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. But I do think it was a great season for Dalton Varsho. And for next year, one of the biggest things they need to improve in his game is what he does against left-handed pitching. Because against righties, of course, Dalton Varsho himself, left-handed batter, was really good against righties. Average wasn't great, but had over 800 OPS. But against lefties, only a 553 OPS against lefties in 2022. That is just not good enough. Now, Dalton Varsho, the thing with him the last couple of years, if you look at his numbers from 2021, really bad in the first half, then elite in the second half. And then that kind of happened again this year. Maybe not as dramatic because his first half this year was better than his first half last year, but he still was a much improved player in the second half. His batting average didn't really increase a lot. It was really the slugging for Dalton Varsho. His OPS went from 708 in the first half to 793 in the second half, tapped into some more home runs, tapped into more speed. Like the speed and power always seems to come in the second half for Dalton Varsho as opposed to the first half, which I don't really understand why. I guess he's adjusting to pitchers in the league. Usually it feels like in the second half, maybe it's pitchers adjusting to the hitters, but somehow Dalton Varsho is adjusting to the rest of the league in the second half, and he's a second half player, which I like. I would rather players perform better in the second half than the first half. So I'm not mad at all that Dalton Varsho is a second half player. Also, for anyone who thinks that maybe Dalton Varsho 
could be the catcher of the future still because you're not high in Carson Kelly and you wouldn't be too upset if Carson Kelly got moved because of all the outfielders in the outfield. You're like, hey, I want Jake McCarthy. I want Alec Thomas. I want Corbin Carroll in the outfield. Let's put Dalton Varsho a catcher. I know his offense might take a step back, but let's do it. Let's see how it can be. Let's try the experiment. Well, let me tell you, Dalton Varsho a catcher actually had better numbers than any other position he played. He had better numbers as a catcher than when he played in the outfield, which is actually surprising because I think a lot of people would have guessed his numbers would have been better when he played in the outfield because of the just less wear and tear on your body than as opposed to being a catcher. But when he played catcher last season, a 279 average and a 797 OPS in, in 79 at bats. So just really solid numbers, really good numbers as a catcher last year offensively for Dalton Varsho. Now, is he the most traditional catcher out there? No, he's probably like an average at best catcher behind the plate. But the fact that he gives you that kind of offensive work tar, like he's a weapon. He's basically could be a Buster Posey level offensive player without the defense as a catcher. Like Dalton Varsho can do that for you offensively as a catcher and be one of the best offensive catchers we've ever seen. One other thing I love about Dalton Varsha, which is something I really key on when I look at these players and rank them, is what you do with runners in scoring position. Dalton Varsha, 293 average, 853 OPS last season with runners in scoring position. Very, very good numbers. His hard contact numbers, uh, those are solid. Those could be better. Considering he's a 27 home run guy with like solid, like good, not great hard contact numbers. If those improve, this could be a 35, maybe a Christian Walker type home run hitter. And his strikeout rate and his walk rate were kind of interesting. He struck out a little bit more in 2022 and he walked less in 2022. Two numbers you don't want to see. But if he's going to be hitting more home runs, if he's going to be stealing more bases, I'm okay with it. If he's going to be a guy that comes through with runners in scoring position, I'm I'm a little bit more okay with him striking out and walking. There's just so many tools for Dalton Varsho that makes him interesting. And the one tool that he even talked about, he's arguably the best defensive outfielder in baseball. Go look at any defensive outfield metric on fan graphs, and Dalton Varsho is likely going to be number one across all those outfield metrics. Dalton Varsho had a phenomenal year defensively, and he should win a gold glove in his first full season, I want to say. Would you consider this Dalton Varsho's first full season? He played 95 games last year, 151 games this year, so definitely Dalton Varsho's first full season. There goes the baseball reference video. I have it set up right now where I have all the videos paused pause, so you don't hear anything for baseball reference, but I made a mistake and I tried to search something up real quick, and that's why the video started playing. So screw you, baseball reference. I'm trying to not do that again, but Dalton Varsho, absolute stud for the D-backs in 2022, and he checks in at number five on the top 10 D-backs power rankings. Now, who checks in at number four? We're going to discuss that next. But first, I want to talk to you guys about Roan because do you guys like wearing dress shirts? Like I'm the type, I'm the type of guy that doesn't like dressing up because dress shirts, they're what? They're tight. They're uncomfortable. And most importantly, they're never my size. But with Roan, that is not the case because the dress shirt was due for radical reinvention and Roan stepped up to the challenge. Roan's commuter shirt is the most comfortable breathable and flexible shirt known to man and here's why roan's comfortable four-way stretch fabric provides breathability and flexibility that leaves you free to enjoy what life throws your way from your commute to work to your 18 holes of golf it does not matter roan is there every step of the way it's time to feel confident with the wrinkle-free shirt without the hassle with roan's wrinkle release technology Wrinkles disappear as you stretch and wear the shirt. It's that easy. With Gold Fusion anti odor technology, you'll be smelling fresh and clean all day long. And on top of that, Roan is 100% machine washable, so you can ditch the dry cleaner altogether. I know I messed that up. 100% machine washable. So, the commuter shirt can get you through any workday and straight into whatever comes next. Head to roan.com slash locked on and use promo code locked on to save 20% off your entire order. That's 20% off your entire order when you head to R H O N E dot com slash locked on and use code locked on. It's time to find your corner office comfort. All right, all right, all right. Let's get back into the podcast. 
Yep, Braves win three to nothing. That just went final, as I saw. So good job by Atlanta to what is that series now? I actually don't remember. I believe the Phillies won game one. So the series is now tied one to one. So that is a very fun Zach Wheeler on the mound for game two, and the Phillies lose. They're going to have Aaron Nola in game three. So I would probably expect the Phillies to win game three just because I don't think I'm going to trust the Braves game three starter. Just quick thoughts on that because I'm sure it's going to be like Charlie Morin or I don't even know who their number three starter is. But whoever it is, after the top two starters for the Braves, I think it kind of falls off a lot. Meanwhile, you're still going to have Aaron Nola going for you if you're in game three for the Phillies. So Phillies have a great chance to go up two to one in game three with Aaron Nola on the mound. So we'll see what happens there. But let's get back into the power rankings because at number four on my power rankings for the top 10 D-backs from the 2022 season, I got Jake McCarthy because Jake McCarthy just had a breakout season for the D-backs. First round, 39th pick back in 2018. And Jake McCarthy this season, I mean, 23 stolen bases, 283 average, 769 OPS in 99 games played. You'll definitely take that from a guy who you didn't expect to do anything this past season. Now, his numbers did dip a little bit at the end of the year. If you look at his last 28 days, the 679 OPS, but still a 273 average during that time. So even when his slugging dipped in that final month, he was still hitting the ball pretty effectively, still had around a 275 average. So you'll definitely take that. Like Dalton Varsho, one of the big reasons why I love Jake McCarthy is because he's elite with runners in scoring position. Jake McCarthy, listen to these numbers because this gets absolutely insane and wild. Jake McCarthy with runners in scoring position 2022, a 403 average, a 986 OPS. Absolutely massive. How about with men on the bases? Not runners in scoring position, just men on the bases. 333 average, 867 OPS. This man crushes when men are on the bases. How about this? How about a really funky wild one for y'all? Two outs and runners in scoring position. So two outs are on the board. There's a man on second. What is Jake McCarthy going to do? Well, in 32 at-bats, he has a 531 average and a 1228 OPS. Just sit for a second and digest those numbers with runners in scoring position, men on the bases. Jake McCarthy absolutely eats in the highest pressure moments. Baseball reference has this fun thing. We can look at a player split through their innings, and they usually have a group by every three innings. So innings one through three, innings four through six, innings through uh innings seven through nine. And for Jake McCarthy, his best innings were innings seven through nine because this guy gets better as we go deeper into the game. 297 average and 790 OPS innings seven through nine for Jake McCarthy. His hard contact stats this season improved greatly from what they were last year. And again, I'm going off the hard contact stats on baseball reference. One thing about hard contact stats and just numbers in general when it comes to baseball is you go on different websites, they have different numbers. So hard contact stats on like StatCast versus Fangraphs versus Baseball Reference all kind of are similar. They're all kind of the same range, but they're also different. So the batted ball, hard contact stats for Jake McCarthy on baseball reference. His exit velo went from 78.8 to 85.5. Hard hit percentage went from 13.9 to 33.7%. And those aren't really great hard contact number stats, but they were greatly improved for Jake McCarthy. And if he can continue to improve and maybe become a like a 12 to 15 home run guy, plus the 30 to 40 stolen base potential he has, and if he could still continue to hit around 275 maybe the slugging is never good but if he's like a 750 ops guy with 280 average 15 home runs and 30 stolen bases that is a borderline all-star level player right that and you'll definitely take that from jake mccarthy he also improved his strikeout percentage a lot 2021 struck out basically 33 percent of the time this year 21 and a half percent of the time for jake mccarthy was absolutely elite with balls in play his Babbitt was 349, which is just monster speed demon for the D-backs this season. 23 stolen bases and 26 attempts. His numbers were pretty much the same no matter what type of pitch he saw. Fastball, off-speed, or breaking ball. Jake McCarthy was killing all three, which is really impressive for a guy who's really young and was only in his second major league season. Some of the you know expected stats, like when you look at expected batting average, expected slugging percentage, some of them might say that regression is coming for Jake McCarthy next season. But guess what? I don't care. I don't believe it. We'll see what happens because I still think Jake McCarthy is a guy who was 
just really good this season. Like sometimes with those expected stats, I'm like, yeah, they might tell you a player is like if a player struggling, sometimes the expected stats tell you, guess what? He's playing a lot better than what he's showing this year. Or sometimes when a player is having like an all-star type season, sometimes the expected stats are like, you know what? Yes, he looks like an uh, yes. Currently, he's playing like an all-star, but the numbers actually tell you it's just a facade. It's just a mirage. You can't believe it. But to me, I'm always like, the numbers are the numbers. Like, yes, there could be a reason, the ballparks you play in, the defense that's behind you. But it, at the end of the day, most of the numbers, I think, are going to be pretty close, pretty similar. And if a guy puts up good numbers and has good production, I'm going to take that to the bank more than the expected stats. So the fact that Jake McCarthy just had a really good season where he looked like a borderline all-star level player for the D-backs. And a guy that we do have to wonder, how does this guy fit into our lineup next year? Because at the halfway point of this year, at the all-star break, I think if we had to project our 2023 lineup at the all-star break this past year, we would have all been like, you know what? Next year, we're definitely going to have Corbin Carroll in the outfield. We're going to have Alec Thomas out there. And we're going to have Dalton Varsho in the outfield as well. That was before we even saw Corbin Carroll play for the D-backs. But we knew he was just going to be an outfielder in the for the D-backs in 2023. Because at worst, we were like, okay, he's going to get the Alec Thomas treatment. Maybe start in the minor leagues and then get called up pretty early in the season. But now, you ask that question now, how you configure the D-backs 2023 lineup. Specifically the outfield. And you're like, does Alec Thomas... Crack the outfield of Corbin Carroll, Jake McCarthy, and Dalton Varsho. Do you just use Jake McCarthy as like your full-time DH in 2022? This way, Alec Thomas can still be that guy in center field roaming around. Like, there's real question marks to how you use Jake McCarthy and whether a guy like Alec Thomas even keeps his job anymore in the outfield because we know Alec Thomas, elite, elite defensive outfielder, but his bat went real quiet in the second half. Meanwhile, Jake McCarthy's bat in the second half took off. I would like Jake McCarthy to improve a little bit defensively. I feel like he could do a better job instinctually tracking down some balls. There were some just angles he took to some balls where I'm like, oh, that probably wasn't the smartest. Uh, this You didn't attack that ball the smartest way possible. So there's still definite improvements in Jake McCarthy's game. But considering this guy was the former first round pick, like there was some pedigree with him. Like maybe we shouldn't be totally shocked at the 25 year old former first round pick actually had a breakout season like it shouldn't be that surprising when you frame it like that but the fact that he wasn't really on a lot of people's radars and then had this kind of season and I think again the most shocking thing to me about Jake McCarthy this year was the fact that he pretty much was good from start to end there was never a point where he really had dips and lulls like he was pretty much that 290 average guy throughout the season and the other thing is I did not know Jake McCarthy was this fast. Like He's like a 95th percentile speed guy, one of the fastest players in Major League Baseball. I think if you go on StatCast and qualify it by like guys with at least 100 play appearances or something like that, I think Jake McCarthy is like top seven in sprint speed. So I didn't know he was that fast. With this kind of ability to hit the ball, any type of ball, Jake McCarthy, you check in at number four on the top 10 D-backs from 2022. Now, we're going to be getting into the top three D-backs from 2022. So who checks in at number three? We got the man, the myth, the legend, Christian Walker checking in at number three for the top 10 D-backs from this past season. Christian Walker had himself a fantastic season, and I'm really happy because last year in 2021, I was telling everyone in fantasy drafts, also in 2020, I was telling everyone, but specifically more to last year because it hurt a little bit more last year if you drafted Christian Walker because I was telling everyone in fantasy baseball drafts last year, get Christian Walker late, take him in the 14th round or whatever. You're going to get a first baseman that can hit 30 home runs and get you 90 plus RBIs and you're going to get him so late. He's going to be such a value for you. And if you did that last year, that method last year, guess what? He, he, he sucked for you. All right. Christian Walker was hurt a lot of 2021. He was dealing with oblique injuries, and the power just wasn't there for him last year. So if you tried drafting him late as a value last year, he screwed you over. But this year, guess what? You didn't have to draft Christian Walker. Most people who had Christian Walker on their fantasy team by the end of the year picked him up off the waiver wire, and they were thankful to Christian Walker because 36 home runs and 94 RBIs from a guy that you picked up off the waiver wire is absolutely insane. And Getting away from fantasy, going back into the real world, Christian Walker, like Dalton Varsho, if you want to go on fan graphs and just start looking through defensive metrics for first baseman, 
Christian Walker was by far and away the best defensive first baseman in Major League Baseball this past season. He should win the gold glove. He's pretty much number one in like every defensive category, which is absolutely insane. So Christian Walker, I mean, the eye test, I thought he was a pretty good defensive player. But when you look at the numbers and how mind-boggling it is and how much better he is than the rest of his competition, it's actually crazy to see. So Christian Walker being this elite defensive first baseman with the power is just such a nice asset to have on your team. And whether the D-backs are good or not next year, like Christian Walker is the perfect type of trade piece. He's someone that every team would want because he's cost controlled. I believe he's still arbitration eligible, which is just absolutely insane for a guy. Christian Walker's caliber. He can hit 30 plus home runs. He's a, a elite defensive first baseman. Like we just said, like he becomes arbitration eligible in 2023. He can't become a free agent till 2025, which kind of sucks for Christian Walker because basically it means we're going to control his money until he hits his mid thirties, which at, you know, isn't really fair, but hopefully the D backs do right by him. If he has another great season, like he did last year or like halfway through the season, maybe the D backs give him a little bump in salary and give him a little, you know, a couple year extension. Maybe, you know, I would be down to pay Christian Walker eight to 10 million a year for a couple of years. Like I think that would be a fine contract for Christian Walker and, is also deserving of it but let's get back into some of the numbers for christian walker because one thing for walker i think people because of the power and typical low average for him they probably just assume that he just crushes lefty pitching but that is true he does crush lefty pitching but he also does really good against righties his numbers are pretty much the same against righties and lefties 845 ops against lefties 791 ops against righties and 29 of his 36 home runs came against right-handed pitching. So a lot of his power came against those right-handed pitchers. And another thing for Christian Walker, like I said, for Dalton Varsho, a lot of these two players have a lot of similarities. Christian Walker, big second half player for the D-backs. His first half, 205 average, 779 OPS. Not the best in terms of the slash line. Still had 22 home runs. He was displaying that power in the first half, no doubt. But in the second half, not only did he continue to show power, but a 285 average and an 833 OPS. Those are all-star slash line numbers from Christian Walker. So I love to see that. His numbers, The one of the weird things about Christian Walker's season is the fact that he wasn't great with runners in scoring position. I think that was kind of the running joke throughout the year with Christian Walker. Like He had all these home runs. He had all these RBIs. But his numbers are runners in scoring position, 224 average, a 736 OPS. Not exactly the numbers you would expect from the guy of the season he just had. I think he had 23 solo home runs. I'm not entirely sure if that's factually correct. I would try and do the math by myself going off baseball reference too. But I think the number is 23 solo shots for Christian Walker, which is which is just absolutely insane. And it also feels correct because it did feel like Christian Walker had more solo shots than you know shots with men on the bases, which is just crazy to think about. Now, he was good in high leverage moments, so the pressurized moments, Christian Walker, 826 OPS in those high leverage moments. And another thing that I loved about Christian Walker, that he really got better as the game went on, because when he faced a starting pitcher the first time through, 812 OPS, but that second time through, 932 OPS. He saw what he he saw way through in that first at bat, first play appearance, and he made adjustments to his game the second time up. And those adjustments led to great results. That's why I felt like Christian Walker would just take over that third or fourth inning because that second time he came up, felt like that's when all of Christian Walker's um home runs were. It felt like every home run Christian Walker had was like the third or fourth inning, which is um just an interesting tidbit to follow. His strikeout rate and his walk rate really improved in this season as well. His strikeout rate went from 23.8% to 19.6%, while his walk rate went from 8.5% to 10.3%. So love to see those numbers improving. His hard contact numbers were also back to just being straight up elite. 90 mile an hour exit velocity and a 44.2% hard hit percentage. Those numbers are absolutely elite. And it makes sense because in 2019, in 2018 with the D-backs, or specifically 2019, he was one of the league leaders in hard contact numbers and stuff like that. Also 2020, I think it was 2019, 2020, Christian Walker was one of the best players in baseball. When you look at exit velo, hard contact stats, barreling the ball up, he was one of the best in that. 2021, he had a huge dip in power. And again, I think some of that was because of injury, but it was able to tap back into that power in 2022. And it led to that monstrous 
36 home run total. He also had a career high in contact percentage, which is why he had that second half batting average of 285. Elite barrel percentage, like I was talking about, 11.5% barrel percentage, and just absolutely crushed the fastball in 2022. I think he had like above 500 slugging percentage against the fastball this past season. So Christian Walker had himself a fantastic year, and we're also going to be doing deeper dives onto each player um, throughout the offseason, we'll do player reviews where we get even deeper into this. But we're going to save the top two D-backs from 2022 for tomorrow's show, the final show of the week. We'll hear who were the top two D-backs from this past season in our power ranking. So we got Christian Walker checking in at number three. We got Jake McCarthy checking in at number four. And Dalton Varsho checking in at number five. We'll unveil the top two tomorrow. I'm sure you guys can guess who who it is after seeing the rest of this list so far. But still, you got to come back tomorrow for more Dimebacks news coverage and insight. Check out who the top two are. Thank you for making Locked On Dimebacks your first listen every day. Go make your second listen of the day. Locked On MLB with our pal Sully Baseball, walking baseball encyclopedia and historian. So go check out his podcast. Come back tomorrow for more Dimebacks news coverage and insight. And as always, stay safe, stay healthy. Deuces.